Hello, hello. I am Nadia Colburn, and I am here today with Waske. I'm very happy to be having this conversation. I'm going to give a little introduction of Ross, and then we will dive into a conversation. So Waske is the author of four books of poetry, Against Which, Bringing the Shovel Down, Beholding, and Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, winner of the 2015 National Books Critics Circle Award, and the 2016 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. His collection of essays, The Book of Delights, was released by Algonquin Books in 2019, and his new book-length poem, Beholding, was released from the University of Pittsburgh Press in September of 2020. Loss is a founding board member of the Bloomington Community Orchard, a nonprofit free fruit for all food justice and joy project. He also works on the Tenderness Project with Shayla Lawson and Essence London, and he has received fellowships from Kaveh Kanem, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and the Guggenheim Foundation. And Ross teaches at Indiana University. He's an incredible writer. Um, I've been reading his work for a long time, and I'm so excited to be having this conversation and an incredible person. So, so good to be here with you. Thank you. It's good to be with you too. Um, so I like to ask a first question about childhood. So you get a little bit of background. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about your childhood and were there things in your childhood that um, kind of prepared you for a life of engagement in poetry? Oh, that's such a good question. And uh, it's, it's <laughs> funny because the older I get, it's funny, like the, the further away I get from childhood, um, I feel like the more I realize in a way, in a way, the question is like, what wasn't preparing, mm -hmm. you know, um, me, me or a person from this possible thing. And um, so when I say that, I mean, like, I just think of so many things. I mean, we grew up in an apartment complex. And so we had just tons of like, there was tons of kids. We had really, really um, this, this kind of way, you know, just an abundance of like playing actually is the word. We played a lot, you know, um, in all these ways, like we fought and we like built stuff and we were like in the woods, you know, you know, there's little shitty woods right next to the apartments, you know, and right next to I-95. And we were, there was kind of like a, there was time and space in a way that, um, um, again, the older I get, I hear myself saying this too, that, that um, you know, it's not so much with like these kids, a lot of these kids don't have the same thing. You know, like time and space, for instance, it's just like, you know, um, we, you know, it was like good parenting, I think, when people were like, get out, don't come back until the sun came down, it comes down, you know, I think that was called good parenting. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And so like we, that's really, you know, and, and so I just feel like we were, we were playing a lot. We were playing together. We were working things out. We were collaborating constantly, you know, as kids. Um, so, you know, whatever, I feel like that's a part of it. I also feel like I have um, folks who have various curious curiosities about, um, making things or language or um, stuff that in various ways, um, the more I kind of like think, the more I hear like um, I'm writing another book of delights and, and I've been uh, transcribing them. And sometimes I hear like very specific things that are like in the corner of my voice that are actually my mother's voice. Mm. And boom, you know, and, or, you know, stuff from my father, boom, it just comes through um language attitudes you know um perceptions misperceptions <laughs> it's just like all of these kind of inheritances um i can go on like i you know i played sports um i still play a lot of basketball but i played sports as a kid and i feel like again that some of the um what what is most dear to me about sport is like practice i love pra i love practicing i love working on stuff um, but I also like doing things with other people, you know, and mm -hmm. so to be like in team sports like that is another thing. Also, you know, I skateboarded as a kid. So basically what I'm saying is everything. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, it's all there, right? It's all of it. It's all of it. it, If you decide, it's like, oh, right, of course, that was informing me. The last thing I do want to say, though, is that that we skated as kids, and I skated, skateboarded. And there was a way that um, this only recently occurred to me because I was writing about skateboarding. I was like, oh, that skateboarding itself, um, you know, if you're like a, you know, like a street skater, you can call it. Um, but if you skateboard on the street, you're perpetually looking at, at your landscape. You're perpetually looking at the built environment for what you might be able to do. You're perpetually metaphoring the, mm. you know, so someone else is like, that's where you put the carts. We might be like, well, that's where you take the cart from, and put it against that and you rail slide, you board slide the cart, you know, and on and on and on. It's sort of perpetual like that. So it's a kind of, it's a kind of way of making metaphor perpetually, um, et cetera. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Um, yeah. And where did you grow up? Just I to- grew up just north of Philadelphia. Yeah, okay. a town called, and a, <laughs> a town called, kind of in between Langhorne and Levittown and Pendell. I guess the address was actually Langhorne, but I think I think Levittown is a is a kind of appropriate way to say where I grew up. Nice. There's a lot of baggage there if you know yeah. <laughs> if anyone wants to go into that. Yeah, but I love that emphasis on play and like um that creative embodied practice, right? Yeah. That that's your poems and your your writing is doing so much with. Um mm-hmm. so and you also said, um, I, I liked you talking about like playing and also fighting, right? Like that working things out, that dynamic relationship. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things I, um, so there's so many things I admire about your poems, but, and your writing in general, but um, one of them is just the way you can hold these different experiences mm-hmm. so, so well, so carefully, like close together, the, the heartbreak and the joy. Um, and is that something that you think you're just temperamentally kind of have always been, or is that something that you needed to work on? If that's, is that kind of part of your poetic project? Just wonder what your thoughts are about that. Well, that is very much now it's part of my like sort of probably poetic and ethical and, you know, spiritual practice. Um, um, I don't know if I... I mean, I feel like I'll just talk the now, like I feel like a lot of my my writing work, my thinking work um, um, is about, you know, my question, my question really, and it came through many things, but really that catalog book and this delights book and the conversations I was lucky enough to have. So it's a kind of collaborative in itself too. It it over the years it made me realize, oh, maybe my subject is really this this thing called joy. And this thing called joy, the way that I perceive it or think of it, um, um, is fundamentally informed by the fact that we're going to die. You know, it's fundamentally informed by the sorrows that, that you do not actually, by being a creature, get to escape, you know? And, you know, it's just like, that's part of the deal. (laughs) We get to, (laughs) we get to do that. And, um, and that kind of that understanding or the, the possibilities of reaching toward one another in the midst of that understanding of the sorrows, to me, is that luminosity, you know, in a way is like, oh, that's, that's this thing maybe like joy and the ways that shows up in all kinds of ways and not always, and maybe it's there and we can't see it. And like, um, but that's a kind of a, a developing practice to sort of be more deeply studying that and wondering about that and like pointing to it and like, oh, oh, I think that's it, you know, (laughs) oh, here we're in it. Um, Which is also to say, to be studying this sort of profound matrix of care that we're in the midst of at every moment, um, despite. Um, And, um, but as a kid, I don't, I don't, I don't know, you know, I sort of, (laughs) I don't know how to answer that. Like, I don't know that I was, um, I always think of myself as like kind of a melancholy kid, Mm. you know, like I always, you know, like when I was 12 or whatever, and Tracy Chapman's uh, Fast Car came out, 
in the song that I listened to, you know, I, that record is just so deep mm -hmm. in my brain, but it was the last song um, called For You. And it's such a, it's such a like melancholic, beautiful <laughs> song, but it's, it's, it's so melancholy. And that, that's kind of, I'm a little bit like that. Like, you know, I've always liked the melancholy. I've always been drawn to the melancholy. Um, but I, but when you asked it, I was like, you know, I've been drawn to the melancholy, but I also like, I'm really pumped about, I'm also really, really pumped about what, you know, maybe the other side of the melancholy. Yeah, yeah. Something, yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of it, right? That it's both and, right? But it's also nice to hear that it's like, um, you know, that, that that melancholic proclivity is there too, you know, and that sometimes we need to kind of um, build them up. I mean, I feel like I've needed to build the muscle of joy and that that's yeah. itself a kind of radical act, Yeah. Um, especially yeah. in our world where it's like, yeah. just wherever you turn, there's bad news, but you get kind of co-opted into this narrative like just buy into the narrative of there's nothing you can do right. we're all separate and right. Right. it's doomed right <laughs> like okay right. but here's my life here's my body here are my friends here are the people i love like i don't want that narrative that's it there's the tree, <laughs> there's the tree right now making it better for me yeah there's the tree right now casting shade on this hot day like there's the tree right now making space for all of these creatures to sort of you know uh, live and survive and thrive and there's da, 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 you know right yeah. there never noticed that tree before in my life oh there's a zillion of them <laughs> you know yeah, yeah totally yeah. um before we move on because there's just so much to say but I was wondering um if we could go back a moment when you were talking about you know it's this kind of realization that we're we're all going to die like it's all ephemeral it's it's just like um if you could go back and maybe read aloud to us from the end of Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude because you talk about that there. And just for people who haven't, if you haven't read this book, which is the Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, and this is the title poem of the book, it's an amazing book. And in the poem, kind of just to give a little background, and I'd love to stay with the poem and the title and the book for a moment, maybe after you read that, but um, just, you know, first of all, the title. Well, actually, let's let's get to the reading in a moment, just because people maybe don't know the work and it's so amazing. Um, but can we talk about that, like, catalog of unabashed gratitude? That's such a great title, and <laughs> um, like, we're often abashed of our gratitude, right? Like, totally. what is the shame around gratitude? Can you talk about I, that? That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I know it. I know it. And when I came up with a title, like I always like to say that I came up with a title for a book after a really beautiful reading, but it was like a, you know, it was a, a, a reading that was like, after it was say this, I left the reading being like in my head. And then the next day in a field swinging kettlebells with my buddy Keith, I was like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to write a book called Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. <laughs> Just because, in a way, because I was like, oh, we, you know, I need this book in the world. I think yeah. I need there to be a book of unabashed gratitude. And when I said it, exactly, I was I'm fully aware exactly what, what you just said, that <clears throat> our, our gratitude, our enthusiasm, our delight, our love, our wonder, et cetera, is, you know, part of being a grown up is a bash, is, how do you say it? Is like a bashing those, is bashing those. <laughs> Yeah, bashing. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's it's, awesome. It's bashing those things. And yeah. you know, like, you know, kids are batshit over stuff, you know, and it's like, why? Yeah, they should be, you know, and because there's so much to be batshit about. It's just like, God damn, like, <laughs> un, un, unbelievable. And like the you know, like just too, too much, too much to love. Like it's just it's just so much. And I, I think so anyway, I, I came up with that title. I was sort of spurred to get to have that title. And then I had to write the poem. <laughs> I've never done this before in my life. Like to have a, be like, oh, I'm going to call this book this. And then be like, oh, I got to, I guess I probably should write a, a poem like that. So that's kind of where that came from. Um, but yeah, like I said, it was fully cognizant of, um, of a way that that kind of 
you know, enthusiasm and like just wild, wild beloving of, of uh, what ought to be beloved, you know, um, is not always, uh, is not always taken care of. Yeah, yeah. And I love that you root that like in that childhood, yeah. the light and that as adults, it's like we have so many reasons to, or to get super, well, for me, superstitious, <laughs> like, you know, in my family, it's like, we ever said anything good, we had to like immediately knock on wood, like, you know, know like, know. don't take it away. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, um, you know, we're kind of, um, yeah, like ashamed of one's good fortune. Yeah. As if it's, or, or this kind of like weird gift economy, like you're, um, like some kind of like hierarchy mm -hmm. or power structure in there, instead of just that child's like amazement at being alive yeah and yeah yeah but, and the know, amazement at being alive too is like i don't i don't know that a kid would say this but it's sort of like this has been given to me like the sun the sun coming through the through the trees or the sun filtering through that squirrel hanging on that oak tree through, through the like question mark of that squirrel's tail the sun is actually filtering that has been given to me you know, and I don't know that a little kid's like, ah, it's given to me. <laughs> but a little kid is like, oh. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I mean, you walk down the street with a little kid and it's like, come on. <laughs> I know, <laughs> it's I an know. an hour to get down I the know. street. It's right, so right. Yeah. yeah, and it's like the wisdom is that, oh, right. They're noting all of this stuff that that is, you know, so often that it's just like, that, yeah. that. Yeah. 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 And I, yeah, I and it's an adult. Go yeah. ahead. As an adult, I feel like part of, you know, as an adult, it's part of the practice is actually to maintain that. You know, it's to maintain that um yeah. the wonder or the or, you know, the gratitude actually, you know. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah. I was going to say, I have this new poetry class that I'm putting out where I'm teaching your work and it's called the poetry of attention. You know, uh -huh. like looking at the way poetry in various forms can help us pay attention. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I want to kind of come back to the attention that you have in beholding also how you, mm. but before we get there, let's just stay with um, the catalog of unabashed gratitude. Um, so I want to also say for those people who don't know the poem, you know, the poem also goes to really difficult places. You say, you know, thank you for taking my father. Mm. You know, you have the death of your father, you have a murdered friend. Right. Um, it doesn't shy away from really, really difficult subject matter. You know, it's right there in in the poem. And what was that like to write? You know, thank you for taking my father or to put that in the poem. Yeah, it's sort of like the and the next line is a few years before his father went down. Right. And um, it's sort of like in the midst of this, you know, kind of ground for you know, br brutal sorrow was some little glimmer of like, man, I'm so glad his father was gone before, before his son left, you know? Yeah, so it was after, right? A few yeah, years Yeah, so my papa died before yeah. my dad. Yeah. And, but it wasn't, it wasn't long, you know? And, and my yeah. grand, my papa was um, not well for like most of, all of my life. Um, and the fact that the fact that they, he probably himself, he probably never in a million years could have imagined that his son would follow him in three years. Mm. Um, and still, that's a little moment of like grace, maybe you call it, that mm -hmm. still he was able to leave before my dad did, you know? Yeah. Um, none of which is not sad. It's, right. it's all of it sad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And still, and still. Yeah. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful yeah. for how that went. Yeah. Um, I had this experience with a therapist once. She was like, do you see the glass half full or half empty? And I was just like, I don't like that question. <laughs> I really sat with it a long time. And, um, and then when I started to really learn about Buddhism and, mm. and practice meditation, it was like, oh, it's not half full or half empty. It's like, it's coming from, it's, it's all empty. Mm. Like, and it's all full. Mm. Like it's both and, it you know, it's not yeah. either or. Totally. And I feel like your poems have 
so much like abundance in them because there's often also this like radical emptiness. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, that's good. That's good. I like so that. So can you read to us? Um, yeah. The end and, and, and the end of this poem also reminds me like at the end, I mean, so much of your work reminds me of Whitman. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. And like the end of the end of Song of Myself, where mm -hmm. he's you know talking about his his own death. But um, yeah, can you read the last little bit? Yeah, of, maybe I'll um, read the last three stanzas. Just that so. would be amazing. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and thank you the way my father one time came back in a dream by plucking the two cables beneath my chin like a bass fiddle strings and played me until I woke singing. No kidding, I was singing and smiling. Thank you, thank you. Stumbling into the garden where the June berries flowers had burst open like the bells of French horns. The lily my mother and I planted oozed into the air. The bazillion ants labored in their earthen workshops below. The collard greens waved in the wind like the sails of ships and the wasps swam in the mint blooms, viscous swill. And you, again, you for hanging tight, dear friend. I know I can be long-winded sometimes. I want so badly to rub the sponge of gratitude over every last thing, including you, which yes, it's awkward. The suds in your ear and armpit, the little sparkling gem slipping into your eye. Soon it will be over, which is precisely what the child in my dream said holding my hand, pointing to the roiling sea and the sky hurtling our way like so many buffalo who said, it's much worse than we think and sooner. To whom I said, no duh, child in my dreams. What do you think this singing and shuddering is? What this screaming and reaching and dancing and crying is other than loving what every second goes away? Goodbye, I mean to say. And thank you every day. Thank you. That's so beautiful. And um, yeah, I love to hear you read your poems. Mm, thank you. Um, I, I stumbled upon this book in a bookstore. Like, I think right when it came out, the catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, I was just kind of like, is there any new contemporary poetry that I'm interested in? Was like, oh my well, God, this book is amazing. <laughs> and then I, I heard you read. Um, that year when you were in Cambridge, it's like, yeah. oh my gosh, <laughs> you're such a good reader. Mm -hmm. um, that music and mm -hmm. uh, the embodiment, like the the just careful attention to the natural world, um, the address to the reader. I mean, there's just so much there. Mm -hmm. um, like, have so many things I want to talk to you about. But could you talk a little bit, maybe about about your your work in community gardens and and kind of yeah. working with the earth because yeah, it's such totally. a big part of your your poetics too right yeah Just for sure that. for sure one of the um when I moved to Bloomington um which is like 14 years ago now I I started gardening in a serious way and um, I never had before I just always lived in apartments um didn't have access to that and um and I think kind of like a confluence of things my partner's a gardener um I moved here and gardening was just sort of like it was very much like where I was going it was like gardening was happening you know um and and also you know like one of my best friends from home um his dad was a gardener and they were getting ready to move and so I kind of like got in my head like oh I gotta have a place to like transplant Mr. Lau's figs and his you know other stuff and um so there are all these kind of <laughs> you know pressures and um so anyway I started gardening back in like 2007 or 8 um yeah 2000 probably summer of 2007 I said, no summer of 2008 I started gardening <laughs> um but then um but but one of the projects that's been so so important you know I've, I've worked in like um some community garden stuff and um other little things but one of the projects that's been so important to me and shows up some in this catalog book um and elsewhere i'm working on this other book and i have a kind of a longer meditation on this community orchard 
Um, it's called the Bloomington Community Orchard. And it's this, um, it's really this project was started, it was sort of come up with by this person named Amy, Amy Countryman, who's a dear friend and a neighbor, actually. We like, you know, we're always trading stuff from the garden, et cetera. Um, but Amy was an undergraduate at Indiana University and was just trying to, was doing a project sort of thinking about food security and like, you know, this and that. And, and so she, she just did a survey or something of the, found out that the urban canopy, which means the trees that grow in the city that the city manages, you know, you know, how much, how much fruit food does it produce, you know, next to nothing um, that we were that certainly that we were using or that, you know, for human consumption. Um, and out here, it would be like persimmons, you know, you know, if you'd call, if, if black, if they even counted black walnuts, which is good food, but it's, it's a uh, labor intensive. <laughs> and then, um, you know, I don't know, like pop, maybe they manage pawpaw grows. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, the point was that, um, the point was that, oh, maybe we should have a community orchard, a place where we could grow, uh, you know, together some, some fruit. And, and her logo that she came up with was free fruit for all. Um, so I'm kind of echoing that when I say, a. uh, a, what a, like a damn I forget you but you kind of smiled when you said it the fruit and justice project fruit, fruit food justice and joy project mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of echoing that yeah yeah um but anyway so that project um it was basically Amy had a call out a bunch of us came out well, like you know a bunch a hundred some people came out and then we just kind of as this kind of somewhat amoebic but somewhat kind of coherent um collective started doing the work to plant this, make this orchard, which, you know, we had a little land that the city let us use an acre or so, and <clears throat> all this wisdom. We had a lot of elders involved, um, plenty of whom are gone now, you know, and we had all these people who were not um, elders helping us out, you know, helping out all of these, some of whom are gone, you know, and just, just um, an amazing project and a project where also we had to sort of really contend hard with, you know, the real things of like when you're doing community projects, um, like an orchard, you know, to me, one of the most important things, I always talk about this, that came up in the making of this orchard was the question of whether or not you lock the doors, lock the gate to the orchard. And because we put in a zillion hours and because it was funded with grant money from so-and-so and because da, 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 and because, you know, that's sort of of course, in a certain mindset, you lock everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but the orchard itself was a dream of some other kind of mindset, you know, mm -hmm. it's an enactment of an elsewhere. Um, so there's not a lock on it. There's not a lock on it. And, you know, it's fine, of course. Um, but so anyway, that whole project of like working together and, you know, I've had many of those in my life, but but this one it was also so moving because, you know, like if I'm coaching or if I'm like on a team or if I'm doing a lot of teaching, a lot of the other things that I've done, it feels like often, um, it feels like often you can kind of see within six months what you've done. You might be able to see like what your work have, has done. Although of course, as you teach, you realize, oh, you might not know. If mm -hmm. you're lucky enough to be alive two decades mm -hmm. later, and then someone call you, text you, and be like, or email you, and be like, "Hey, <laughs> you don't know this, and you don't remember me, but you taught me so." That's nice. Um, but with an orchard, it was a real, it was a real practice, and I think experiment and endeavor in doing something, the fruits of which you very well may not be around to, to uh, witness, and which means it was a kind of like we're doing this for each other. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, yeah. We, each other we do not know, but even, you know, so it's sort of the, the, that makes all the each other's us, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, that you can kind of tell by, even by, I think by how I talk about it, it is very informative, even in terms of like, yeah. when I talk about a fundamental question about this thing called joy, it's like, oh, that's one of the places where I was kind of deepening or learning that mm -hmm. question. Yeah. I love that you said an enactment of elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. that's a beautiful phrase. And mm -hmm. like this, just changing the mindset, right? Like we don't need to take the locks. Like again, like take the locks off the door, take the hinges off, yeah. right? Like yeah, what yeah, he yeah. says, like just, yeah. Um, yeah. 
and that we can we can imagine something different yeah I mean, I have an apple tree in my tiny little front yard and we got so many apples this year. It's just so great. And then there's an apple tree I was noticing down the street, right outside a public library. Uh -huh. Actually it's outside a community center, um, but the apples are just falling. It's like, uh -huh. they're up high. I, yeah. I wanna like go there. I think I'm gonna actually, maybe I'll do that this afternoon. I'm like, hey, do you have a plan to like eat these apples? Yeah. They're so good. Yeah, you know, yeah. just this like possibility of abundance, this yeah. possibility of like the world provides for us. Yeah, yeah. Like to come out of the scarcity mindset and to yeah. kind of imagine something different. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Like there's enough. And with that kind of, I mean, that's a kind of, that's just true. And then to sort of practice that understanding, you know, I think, I think it makes us inclined to share. Yeah. I think that's what it is, you know. And I wonder if I know that apple tree actually, the one that you're talking about. Because when I was living there, on Vin, the one on Minge Avenue or on on my house? <laughs> no, no, I think on Ridge, maybe. Ridge, yeah. And then that, and yeah, because I I remember when I was there, that's that fall when I'd be walking home from the Radcliffe Institute, I would be, I would every night, I would grab like three or four apples off the ground. Yeah. Um, and they were, it was like <laughs> some of the best apples I ever ate in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to go later today. Yeah. I'm going to go like knock on the door. Yeah. But yeah, that's so cool to, um, to think about fruit and, and to think also about, you know, this, this land that was, had so much fruit on it. Yeah. It was cultivated for, you know, thousands of years, like the garden that America was. Right. That right. was providing. Right. Um, right. I'm mindful of time. So I just want to, just jump forward to um, beholding. Okay. Um, I mean, so much we could talk about, but um, I mean, beholding is an amazing book. So for those of you who don't know the book, mm -hmm. um, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a whole book length poem. And um, it's basically, it starts with you're looking at a YouTube video of Dr. J making this amazing shot in basketball kind of like flying up and <laughs> I did watch like <laughs> um, I grew up like without a tv and like without knowing anything about sports so I was one of those people who had to actually look this up um probably like one of the few people in my generation though my husband was like I don't know Dr. J <laughs> he was like yeah okay of course you didn't but um so that's my little confession but so anyway, but it was a it was a joy to 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 learn and to watch um, and the kind of like dancing and the playing. Mm -hmm. um, so you're watching this YouTube video and then you're thinking about a lot of different things. You're you're looking really carefully at something in motion, but you're slowing it down. It's in the past, but the whole poem also kind of takes place in the present of watching which is yeah. so it's like doing really interesting things with time, past and present, and then of course future. And then also with, um, with, with, the, with watching, with attention, and also movement and stillness, right? Because you're watching, but you can also stop it and go back and then there's still photographs throughout, throughout the book. Right. Um, and it's really about like a lot of things. So I, I won't, I won't, say what it's really about because it's about so many things but one of the things I'm really interested in is um this act of perception mm -hmm. you know which we've been talking about we've been talking about how you can change the story yeah. but this book also talks about um you know how perception and attention can be dangerous also mm -hmm. you know we've been talking more about um kind of sacred attention and mm -hmm. um the philosopher I'm sure you know this but something I you know, has a touchstone for me is Simone Weil saying absolutely unmixed attention is prayer, mm -hmm. right? That, that we can have this form of attention that's a kind of sacred attention. Yeah. But then there's also a form of attention that is commodifying. Mm -hmm. um, and you look at some photographs of Black people um, and the... Um, the pain and the kind of commodification of that pain. Mm -hmm. um, I have some 
I mean, maybe you can even think if there's a part of the poem that you want to read. But I wanted to just kind of have a conversation also about the the challenges of perception and yeah. and and the possibilities of perception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think some of the questions that this book raises are they are those questions. They're like, um, you know, the the sort of the central the central action of the poem is actually it's just me watching. Dr. J flying through the air and doing something impossible. It's me just watching this moment of genius, of um, impossible flight, which he does. And, but in the, so that's one of the modes of looking, but in the meantime, I'm sort of contemplating all of these other modes of looking that are, um, that are commodifying, that are murderous, that are um, all of these other things. And in a way, I think what the book is trying to sort of, is trying to, understand is how how the ways that we witness I think that's the word I mean um, but the ways that we witness are themselves world making you know so that um, um, well I mean which just basically begs the question of like um, as I say again and again and again and again throughout the book what are we looking at what are we practicing mm -hmm. you know? that looking in itself is a kind of practice and the way that we look is a kind of practice. Um, and a practice that can, again, it can be, um, it can be murderous or it can be like, you know, toward the end of the poem, there's a kind of beloved and beloved looking. And there's all throughout the poem, there's all this, you know, moments of like, I think probably what I'm trying to do is be like trying to witness constantly trying to witness the beloved. Um, and I think the poem is trying to learn how to do that. The poem is trying to sort of like, you know, it's a weird poem because it, the more I think about it, it's a, you know, I love, I, love, I, I love this poem in part because I, it's still a little bit, I'm learning things about it all the time. Mm -hmm. Like when we talk, I'll learn things. And, but also like the ways that it does time. So like it's the, the bracket of time that the, the, poem, the action of the poem happens, the sort of real time is, I don't know, it's like five hours or something. <laughs> but then there's all these other like, like sort of time things that are happening. But by the course, in the course of the, of how long it takes for Dr. J to make the shot in the poem, the speaker is trying to learn how different systems can kind of um, I don't know if the word's corrupt, but maybe the word is corrupt. Our capacity, our capacity, to, capacity to see in the ways that we might want to be seen, you know, and our capacity, which is also to say our capacity is to see with, um, in ways that might make our lives livable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, um, so, you know, so the poem is just trying to figure that out. They're trying to, trying to figure that out. And, and by the end, it, it sort of ends on these Carrie Mae, this Carrie Mae Weems photograph where there's been all of this wondering about what, what is this mode of looking doing? What is this mode of looking doing? What is this mode of looking doing? Thinking about the, ins from the photograph's perspective, perspective sometimes and from the viewer's perspective sometimes. And toward the end of the photo, so it's like, it's all this reading of photographs, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but by the end, that Carrie Mae Weems photograph, um, which is really like, oh, this feels like an example of a photograph that is beholding its subject, that is regarding its its subject so much that the 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 act of looking is absolutely an act of care. And in one of the ways you can tell in this photograph is because the people are like trying to run through the <laughs> through the camera to like you know, to squeeze the person probably who's taking the picture. That's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I know that just went on for a while. Sorry. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's beautiful. And um, I'm just going to say something back, as you said, that um, the ways we witness our world making, right? Yeah. That, that's beautiful. And that, um, that in that, in that interaction of perception, yeah, there's this relationship yeah. and how we tend to that relationship is how we tend to our world. Yeah. Um, and that it's, you know, I don't know, someone I think about is like Martin Buber. It's not an I, it relationship. It's right. an I, thou relationship. Right. This right. Right. Kind of 
in so many brilliant ways, um, explores and acts and makes a practice of, you know, and a lot of times you're like, actually feel this, like slow down. Like yeah. that was hard, that material I just gave you. Breathe, yeah. like breathe, yeah. take a moment, like pausing yeah. in the same time or at the same time that there's so much motion in the poem. Right. So, right. yeah. Yeah, good, thank you for yeah noticing that. Um, how are you doing on time? Let's- I think my wait. next thing is, um, I think I'm good. Let me just check real quick. Um, Yep, I'm good. Should we go 10 more minutes? Sure. Is that okay? That's great. So can you just tell us maybe a little bit about your um, your creative process? Like how, how how do you sit down and write? How do you revise? What what does that look like for you? <laughs> it looks like many things. You know, <clears throat> I I sort of am a um, a writer who gets taken, it's into a thing. I think if, if like my my proclivity is to get taken. And to be all in and just working and working and working and then probably like quiet time, you know, and, and then it happens again. I think that's right. Um, but I, you know, when I wrote this book of delights, which is a, you know, a collection of essays that I wrote between August 1st and August 1st, 2016 and August 1st, 2017, it's a daily practice. Um, so in a way, I kind of almost feel like I learned something different, you know, and I didn't do it every single day, but I did a lot of days. And so then I had a daily practice, which was a little bit different for me. I tried that before, you know, because some of my, like Marie Howe is one of my teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think I remember her talking about having like a real proper every morning. I don't know if it was eight to 12 or something, but she was very straight. And I've known other people who just kind of do it like that. And I've tried that and it's kind of not, it's not really my way. <laughs> but then I gave myself this little project so that I had to write these essays for a half hour, just a half hour every day. Um, so sometimes I am kind of a daily writer, but I think more, more interesting to me is that, um, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but I'm, I'm very, like, I love to revise. Mm. <laughs> so I'm in this moment of revision right now and I actually have a, a, an essay here um, that, that I just revised that I just revised and I had a printout and I'd gone through it and I'm like, oh, let me read it again. I want to revise it again. Because <laughs> it's just like, you know, I don't know, at this point, like one of the one of the great pleasures um, is to like just, just keep going, to just keep going on a thing to sort of see how, you know, because for me, like revision is actually like, it is like revision. It is like okay. you write the thing, yeah, and then you write the thing and then it, then you start to see the thing differently. And then the thing starts to teach you what in fact you're, you're sort of looking for or what in fact you did not know you needed to listen to. Um, and so, and I know that, and even if I lose track of that, like sort of consciously, I know because the way my sort of devotion to revision, it's the devotion of someone who's been, a, been rewarded, <laughs> you know? So I'm just like, I'm so in it because I know, I just know that, that this, the switching of a little bit of syntax might then change everything. Mm -hmm. And it might, it might change everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, that's all to say that I'm in a, um, I, I sometimes have a daily practice. I'm writing another book of delight. So to, now I have another daily practice, but when I'm in it, my daily practice is often revision. You mm -hmm. know, where nice. And it can be basically any moment I get that I'm not doing something else. I'm probably like making notes, you know? And yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I love revision also. And I love that like, what is it that I'm trying to say? Like, what what is behind here? Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Or what is it that I don't even know that my work knows that it totally. wants to teach me? Totally. What can I learn here? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I love that yeah. so much. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, just to close us out, I like to um, ask three final questions to kind of share um, with readers um, or listeners, uh, just some enthusiasm, some ideas and practices. So the first is, um, 
is there something that you want to recommend like that's bringing you some joy a book a piece of music um a kind of tree anything oh, that comes yeah. to mind um aretha franklin's amazing great grace um i've been listening to that um this whole the last i guess the last two or three months in since june um the, the movie is amazing. The movie is amazing. Um, the, the documentary that came out, I don't know, two years, three years ago now. But um, I've just been listening to that um, <laughs> that album so much. And it's just like, it itself is a kind of set of rabbit holes. Like, and it's made me, you know, cause she covers Marvin Gaye's Holy Holy, which has kind of pushed me back over to what's going on in that album. Um, but yeah, that that record, and and two songs in particular, the Mary Don't You Weep and Never Grow Old. That's just like, um, I'll put those on and I'll like do my workout, you know, and yeah. I have this workout where it's like a 500 rep workout and I'll just, and I'll do it and I get through Mary Don't You Weep, you know, usually the hard part of the workout and then it gets a little, little easier when Never Grow Old, you know? <laughs> Well, us don't you weep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can do this. You got it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, maybe I'll put a little clip on at the yeah. end of this. That's that's great. Um, and is there a practice that you have, a practice for centering, alignment, joy? What um we talked a lot about practice actually, and there's a lot about practicing and beholding, but I think I do actually. Um it is sometimes it's a practice where I'm sort of writing 30 minutes every day of doing it, but I do have a practice, I think of trying, of, um, I'm trying to cultivate a practice of acknowledgement, I think, mm -hmm. you know, just sort of steadily, just like, you know, even when I'm like, um, this morning I was, you know, drinking my coffee and looking into the garden and I was like, whoa, that, that cardinal is eating our ground cherries, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, no wonder I love the Cardinals so much, you know, because we have loves in common. And but it was just like trying to just pay pay attention, you know. It's just like what you're talking about, like trying to pay attention and the paying attention, not only noting, not only as a way of noting, which I think is really important, but also as a way of um acknowledging and, and thanking, you know. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, and then my final question, is there some form of social or political action that you engage in? Um, and I know we've talked about, you know, just like world making and the imagination and then also the community garden. But is there anything else? Because I think so often um, we kind of get siloed into just kind of one form of action and yeah. to just, you know, hear about what else you might be doing. Yeah, you know, um, I am um i am my partner and i etc are the um um often recipients and often um givers of um things we grow things we cook <laughs> things yeah. we make so you know that um that you know practicing sharing yeah and, and being the recipient of of uh other people's desire and interest to share as well that's beautiful i love that giving and receiving both in yeah. that in that answer there that that's that is actually you know that's like a practice too like when someone gives you something not be like oh here's something too here's something back mm -hmm. no 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 we're 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 tied together forever mm. let's have this go on forever you know, you don't have to give me something right now. We're together, you know? Yeah. Like, let's do that. Yeah. And that kind of um, time span that you're talking about with the trees as well. You know, it's going to be bearing fruit for future yeah. generations. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. We're practicing how to take care of each other for yeah. the long haul. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Maybe just if we have two more minutes, is there yeah. any section of um, any section of another poem or of beholding or of a new work that you're working on that you want to read? Oh, oh, I love that. Um, you know, I actually have a little thing 
then maybe I could read a. Oh yeah. Awesome. <laughs> this is a gift. Speaking yeah. of gifts. So this is from this essay that is um it's intensely um it's intensely particular. It's the sort of thing where um, you know, if you didn't know Dr. J's move, <laughs> I'm talking about very precise. I'm doing this kind of riffing, but it's called Joy and the Cover. And, and I'm talking about covers of like song. It starts off with, well, it's a meditation on Luther Vandross's cover of Dion Warwick's song, A House Is Not a Home. But then it just goes on to sort of like the idea of, of that we're actually perpetually covering each other in a perpetual cover. And <clears throat> um, see if I can say this, figure out how to say this. Um, <laughs> this may or may not, oh, okay, it's two paragraphs. The cover or the version. So again, it, start, it starts off in the cover of a song, in covers of songs. The cover or the version, which is also to say the gift, that which will be covered or versioned forth, is fabriced into hoop, basketball, and music, and maybe art generally, about which Lewis Hyde could tell you a few things though he doesn't talk about hoop, as I recall. Oh, also cooking, duh. Grandma's buttermilk pancakes, mom's apple crisp. And gardening, mama always grew her okra out of a sweet potato patch, mom always grew lilies. And teaching, I got that exercise from my friend Kathy, that one from Pat, that one from Ada, that one from Janan. And skateboarding, I wanted to be Caballero or Jesse Martinez, it's called a reach. And dancing, Bobby Brown, Kid and Play, my friend Jim did that cabbage patch on steroids. Keith's Roger Rabbit was a mountain to ascend. Fashion, I'm 47 years old and still trying to dress like TLC, seems to me. Or singing, how many hours have I spent imitating, covering Terrence Trent Darby, Lenny Kravitz, Al Green, Tracy Chapman, Roberta Flack, Donnie Hathaway, Joni Mitchell, Basha. I guess we could go on like this for a while. All of which is to say that maybe it is the case of course it is, that the cover is perpetual. We are perpetually covering. We are ever citational. It is called thinking. It is called learning. It is called making. It is called being a creature with, which is our only choice. Un Non-possessive, undeclared citationality, which I'm gonna go out on a limb here and just call life. <laughs> There. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy I asked you if you had something to share. That was such a perfect <laughs> end to the conversation. Uh, um, you know, sharing, yeah, being in conversation, um, acknowledging. Yeah, yeah. And creating, being in that imaginative, creative, fruitful space. That's it. That's it. So thank you so much. This was such a joy <laughs> to be well. here with you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. Awesome.